What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the headquarters. It is still technically the headquarters. I'm just in a different room. There's a wall between the HQ and where I'm at right now. You know, your man doesn't get a lot of fresh air this time of the year, so I figured I'm gonna leave my room and come into the living room, set up a little headquarters office out here. So that's what we're doing today. We're talking about my wide receiver rankings, and we're gonna break it down by tiers. A lot of people ask about my rankings, and all of my rankings, my top 250, along with positional rankings by tiers, can be found in my draft guide, which is a link down below, as well as on my website, bigdogsfantasy.com. But I figured I'd give y'all a little taste so y'all could sample the product. So we're gonna break down maybe my first seven, eight, nine tiers or something like that, depending on how far we get down the list, talk about my wide receiver rankings. And for those of you who don't really understand the concept of tiers, it's pretty much a way to break up skill players that are ranked closely. So if you have three players in the first tier and then it breaks up into the second tier, that would mean that you want one of those first three players. There's a gap between the rankings. Although there's only one ranking gap in terms of the actual ranking, so it might be between wide receiver three and wide receiver four, it's not the same gap as in wide receiver two and wide receiver three. If they're in the same tier. So what it's saying is, you know, the tiers, the guys that are in the tiers above another tier means they're a lot more valuable than just one ranking apart, if that kind of makes sense. So then it helps break up in your drafting positionally. So if you have two different wide receiver tiers, there's probably going to be like a running back ranking or running backs in between the two tiers or a tight end or something like that. But I've done enough uh, blabbering. So let's just get into the rankings, let's get into the tiers and let's break down this motherfucker like a shotgun. So before we start the video, I want to know who is someone that you're avoiding uh, that's ranked inside the top 10 so that you're completely fading this year and you're not allowed to say Mike Evans because that's going to be everyone's answer, I feel like, because I think technically he's going inside uh, the top 10 wide receivers. But but I want, I want you all to think logically. I want you all to think outside the box a little bit and tell me about someone in the top 10 that you're not going to wind up with on your team because... Me doing this video, um, I didn't think I was gonna find anyone like that, but I did. Someone surprised me that didn't end up on my team, and it's not DeAndre Hopkins, because I know in yesterday's video, when I talked about the top players to avoid at the wide receiver position, he was one of them based on his ADP, but there was another wide receiver that I'm probably fading this year. But let's get into the tiers, and we have tier numero uno. Uh, a man stands by himself, this should come as no surprise to you, it's Antonio Brown of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's got like seven straight years of 7,000 yards, 7,000 touchdowns, 7,000 catches. Let's move on. Tier number two is made up of four guys. So Odell Beckham, Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins in that order. Odell is just one of those guys that it's nearly impossible to pass on in your draft without regretting it. They are very close. Like I said, they're in the same tier. Odell, Julio, DeAndre, Michael Thomas. But Odell is a guy who just gives you so much explosive playmaking ability, and he's so consistent on a week-over-week -week basis. I want to show you his per-game numbers. These are his 47 games that he's played in the NFL thus far, and these include his first few games in which he got off to a slow start. As you can see in this chart, you are literally getting 18 half-point fantasy points per game from Odell Beckham when he is on the field. Almost 95 receiving yards, 0.81 touchdowns per game, 6.66666 reception, shout out Pusha T. The Giants, they finally have a group of weapons on this offense to take some pressure off of OBJ between Ingram, Barkley, Sterling Shepard, and I'm excited to watch him back on the field, man. I think just as a football fan, we missed him last year with him missing almost the entire season. So OBJ is a guy, when you just look at the numbers, what he does on a per game basis, it's so hard to argue against him. He's someone that opens up the field and on any given play, he can take a seven yard slant and turn it into a, a 80, 70, 60 yard touchdown. And that's not really the case for guys like DeAndre Hopkins or Michael Thomas. Um, Julio can do it, but you don't see it as often with those guys. Odell Beckham's someone that will do that for you a couple games a year and will really win you some games. Julio's my number three. And he ain't far off by any means. Four straight years of 80 catches and 1,400 receiving yards. You know, if you watch my In the Muck Monday video of Julio versus Michael Thomas, I broke it down in depth why I think Julio's numbers last year were really far out of the norm. Um, and you should expect a major bounce back in the touchdown department. And you could look at his drop off last year and you could look at his three touchdowns and you can either say, okay, uh, that was either an outlier of a year and you can definitely expect positive regression or Julio's actually falling off. And I think it's 
pretty much uh, safe to say that it was an outlier a year after scoring six touchdowns, eight touchdowns, six touchdowns. You look at Josh Hermsmeyer's game speed um, on airyards.com, and Julio is absolutely not slowed down whatsoever. His, his game speed is still far, far, far above other NFL wide receivers. Matt Harmon's reception perception is still super high on Julio. Still a very good route runner, still a very good technician, along with the speed, athleticism, size, all that stuff. Uh, last year was just a very, very much of an outlier year. He's usually way more consistent than that. And I understand if you owned him last year, you're probably not going to want him. But I'm telling you, if you fade Julio this year, you're going to regret it at the end of the season. And for me, uh, the next two guys up are Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins. For me, there's almost no difference between the two of them, in my opinion. If I had to project, project out end of season numbers for Michael Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins, they would probably be almost identical. I could see them both ending up with about 1,200, 1,250 yards and probably somewhere between seven and nine touchdowns. So I'll take the guy with Drew Brees as his quarterback and not the guy that has a quarterback who is coming off a seven game sample size, who obviously has looked good this preseason, but I'm just like, if you're taking Watson over Breeze as an actual real life quarterback, then I don't, I don't know, what is you doing, baby? What is you doing? So give me Breeze and Michael Thomas over DeAndre Hopkins. As I explained in my top players to avoid video yesterday, DeAndre Hopkins saw a 35% target share. And that is such a, an enormous number that's almost guaranteed to come back down to probably around 30%, especially when they have Will Fuller, um, Bruce Ellington, Kiki Cootie, if he gets healthy, Jordan Aikens coming in. Strength of schedule should be much better. A better defense means less passing. Uh, you know, it, it's just a lot of things line up for Hopkins's numbers to come down. And if he's not seeing a, a ridiculous number of targets and the volume that he saw last year, I think that his numbers will kind of come back down to earth and people will be a little bit disappointed if they're taking him as the wide receiver one or two in the top eight there. So, I mean, I'm not saying, listen, I'd be ecstatic with DeAndre Hopkins as my wide receiver one if I were to, if I were to get a running back before him. But that is the reason why I have Michael Thomas over DeAndre Hopkins. But they're all in the same tier for me, all elite wide receiver ones. Tier three, I know a lot of people would probably throw Keenan Allen in that tier, but I'm going to I'm gonna put him back into this tier. Um, and you could argue that both of these guys are in tier number two with the o Odells and Julios. But tier number three is Keenan Allen of the Chargers and Devonta Adams of the Packers. And again, both high-end wide receiver ones would love either of them as my wide receiver one. Allen offers, you know, league-leading reception upside, while Adams offers this league-leading league touchdown upside with Aaron Rodgers. I would go Allen in full PPR. I would probably lean Devontae Adams in uh, standard league. So when I was watching Green Bay play this, this uh, preseason, and I, was, I, was, I mentioned this in my week two recap, anytime Aaron Rodgers drops back to pass, his first read, I mean, normally, obviously, it's going to be the wide receiver one, but he is staring at Devontae Adams, especially when they get down near the end zone. He wants to see if, um, if Adams is in single coverage. He wants to see if Adams creates that quick, quick separation. And I think that's obviously going to eventually translate into ton of volume, ton of uh, red zone and end zone looks where they pass the ball like 75% of the time, which is um, which has been historically one of the top passing heavy offenses in the red zone over the, over the few years um, previously where Aaron Rodgers has been healthy and been the quarterback. And I think I have some stats here on that. In the one drive Rodgers played in their last preseason game, they literally passed the ball on all six plays. One, If you look at the box score, one of them ended up being a scramble by Rodgers, but obviously the intent of that play was for Rodgers to pass the ball. You're just seeing how pass-heavy this offense is going to be, and even if you don't think Devonta Adams on a skill technician sense is on the level of these other guys, the amount of volume that this Packers offense is going to offer in the passing game is going to be monstrous for Devontae Adams. I was looking at red zone and 10 zone numbers, so targets inside the 10 zone or attempts inside the 10 zone. Back in 2016, when Rodgers was fully healthy, of course, they threw the ball inside the 10 zone on 63% of their plays and 67% of their plays inside the red zone, which was the second highest rate in the entire NFL. I expect that to be similar in 2018, where we kind of have a scattered running game, and obviously they're going to depend heavily, heavily on Aaron Rodgers' arm to score the ball. So I think if nothing else, you're at least giving yourself volume with Devontae Adams on the most valuable part of the field. And in redraft leagues, you chase volume, you don't chase efficiency. And Allen will be right up there, man. He finally played that full 16 games. He showed that he is a top three wide receiver in terms of being a technician and a route runner and gaining separation. Um, he's never really been a big touchdown guy. I will say throughout his career, right, he's been volatile in the touchdown department. He ended up scoring, I think, six last year. 
and uh, he got a ton of volume down there. He actually led all NFL wide receivers with 24 red zone targets and 15 10 zone targets. And the thing about that is like, you could say that that's gonna come down, right? And he's not gonna be as efficient or he's not gonna see as much volume down there. But now of course, Hunter Henry is gone for the year. Antonio Gates has not resigned. So they only have Virgil Green as their tight end. Um, last year, Hunter Henry and Antonio Gates combined for 23 red zone targets and 19 10 zone targets which is wild. So I, I think like, I think what this says is I need to be higher on something in the Chargers offense, whether it's Melvin Gordon's rushing touchdown upside or it's Mike Williams touchdown. I really don't like Mike Williams. I really don't think he's going to be a thing in redraft, but I could see him ending up with like 500 receiving yards and maybe like seven touchdowns just because there's so much opportunity to be opportunity to be had there in the end zone. And maybe it is, you know, maybe Allen is a lock to end up with uh, leading the, the wide receivers in red zone targets and 10 zone targets. So uh, maybe I need to boost him up my rankings for that sense. But like I said, guys, I love all of these top seven wide receivers. Tier number four. So originally when I when I wrote this blog post a couple days ago, prior to hearing the Hilton news, I had T.Y. Hilton as number eight, Stefan Diggs as number nine, A.J. Green as number 10, Fitz as number 11. Uh, I think T.Y. Hilton would move now that he's dealing with this shoulder injury that we don't really know what's going on. I'm actually going to check up and see if there's any new news on him right now. So what we do, we do this improvisation right on Big Dog's Gotta Eat. If you're new to the channel and you are not subscribed yet, please scroll down there a little bit. Subscribe to the channel because we're breaking shit down like this leading up to your drafts as well as in season. Um, so yeah, subscribe to the channel and drop a, a thumbs up if you're enjoying the video thus far. So T.Y. Hilton suffered a shoulder sprain at Saturday's practice. The Colts don't consider it serious. Hilton looks day to day, but could sit out the second preseason game. Yes, he did sit out the second preseason game. Shouldn't have any impact on his week one status. Okay, well, I guess it's not as serious as we're seeing. So for now, I'll leave Hilton up at eight. I've been on Hilton all summer, and my thought has always been that Andrew Luck will be ready for week one, and I think that's the uh, that's the best case. I've drafted Hilton in a high percentage of my best ball leagues, and I know Andrew Luck looked very rusty in his last start. He also didn't really have any weapons on the field, and uh, he's just getting his timing back, guys. I really wouldn't I really wouldn't look too into the performance that he had in week two. I think week three will be a big test for him, and he didn't throw the ball downfield whatsoever in week one. He threw it a little bit further in week two, and he was, you know, his arm, I, it didn't look good in terms of like an accuracy sense, but he was throwing the ball hard. And obviously there's, he's completely pain free now. And I'm under the assumption that Luck is going to work himself back into rhythm. And T.Y. Hilton actually might be a guy that if you wanted to can kind of fade in the beginning of your drafts. And then as Andrew Luck becomes more acclimated and as Andrew Luck progresses and gets better and better throughout the, the, you know, the first quarter, the first half of the season, Hilton might be a guy that you could buy low if Luck starts off slow. But I like Hilton, man. I, I, I believe that Andrew Luck will be at least like 85% back to what he used to be, which means T.Y. Hilton is just a couple years removed from leading the NFL in receiving yards. If you are going to be the number one target in this offense where they still don't really have any other weapons besides him and Jack Doyle, they don't really have a running game yet. I, I think he's just set up to be in a very good spot. So Hilton's a guy I'm very high on. And I realize that I'm probably irrationally high on Stefan Diggs, but I'm gonna keep him at number eight. I mean, number nine. He, I'm gonna stick to my guns on this one. He's likely gonna be my third round pick in just about every every fantasy football draft this year. I pretty much, I think I own him on um, every redraft league I've done thus far. As long as someone doesn't take him first, Diggs is going to end up on my team. I think the connection between Kirk and Stefan Diggs is going to be very real. And we've already seen it come to fruition in preseason. Uh, I think he's going to overtake Thielen as that number one wide receiver in uh, the Vikings offense. I know that him and Keenum, Thielen and Keenum had this crazy chemistry. I'm not sure it just automatically carries over into um, 2018, right? It's a different quarterback now, and Kirk is someone with a better arm than Keenum. I think he's going to take a lot more shots to Stefan Diggs. They have a very good offense, should be set up in very good field position for a lot of their drives, and that is where Stefan Diggs really prospers. He's so good at gaining separation. He is the number one wide receiver in the NFL in terms of contested catch rate, and that is, you need someone who can, who can gain separation. You need someone who uh, is really good with contested catches. And that's exactly what you need in the end zone, in the red zone area. And Kirk struggled uh, historically in that part of the field, but giving him a weapon like Diggs who prospers at those two parts um, of his game is I think it's gonna be a match made in heaven. I, I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if Diggs goes for double digit touchdowns this year. Maybe he won't go off for 1400, but I could see him ending up with 
85 catches, 1,200 yards, and maybe 10, 10 touchdowns this year, and I'd be perfectly happy with that. So I think, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good stuff going on in Minnesota. And when you look at this tweet from Matt Harmon, charted wide receivers in reception perception history with a success rate versus man coverage above the 95th percentile. Look at the names on this list. And I actually accidentally cut out the last one. There was John Brown in 2015 as well. I think this bodes well for Stefan Diggs' 2018 projections, my homies. He is amazing versus cut coverage, uh, man and press. He's one of those guys that not only can catch basically everything thrown his way, he's got deep speed, gain separation really easy. I'm just very high on digs. We'll, we'll say that, and you can give me all the digs in 2018. Now, I was talking about one guy I am probably fading. Not, not particularly fading, if you want to call that. We can say that with quotation marks, but he's not going to end up on my team in 2018. And it's A.J. Green, my wide receiver 10. He's probably wide receiver. I've seen him go. I've seen him be people's wide receiver four all the way back to like wide receiver eight or so. But if he's being picked in the second round of my drafts, I'm not going to own a single share of him. And here is my case. It's kind of a long one, so, so stay with me here. The same way I argued for Julio, right? When you look at the previous season and they have a down year, you have to think of a few different scenarios. You have to say maybe this guy is falling off and maybe his statistics are going to stay down where they were, right? Maybe it wasn't just a bias or wasn't just an outlier over here. So you have to look at things that were outside of just team success. So when I look at AJ Green, yes, you could say, oh, the, the offensive line was bad, Dalton played bad, uh, they didn't have a lot of plays, you're expecting that to go up and all these things, right? But you have to look at things subjectively and you have to look at things, um, I mean, objectively, you have to look at things that are outside of just the team success. And that's what I wanted to do with Green. So here's what I found. You almost never see a guy finish where Green finished last year with the target share he had and the air yards market share. Um, Green finished last year with 1,078 receiving yards, which is not good at all considering where um, he ranked in terms of market shares. So he had 28% of his team's targets, right? 28% team target share, which was third highest in the NFL. He also had 56% of his team's air yards, which was the single highest number in the NFL. Third highest in terms of just targets, first in air yard share. So air yards, if you guys are unfamiliar with it, it's just the amount of yards that traveled you know, by a throw. And that's a, a kind of a new statistic that's starting to hit the mainstream a little bit now, but it's more predictive than um, just raw targets. First in the NFL in air yards, third in the NFL in team target share, but he still just finished with 1,078 yards. What concerns me even more is this. This is game speed from airyards.com. And basically it's just like, they track how fast a player is, right? Against uh, the positional average in the NFL. In 2016, he was absolutely elite. His game speed was super, super high. But going into 2017, FUPA, yes, ja, 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 get it, get it out, you immature MFs. FUPA, which means fastness under or above positional average, right? That's what the FUPA stands for on the right side of this chart. 2017, he was actually below average in terms of just NFL wide receivers, which is not something you would expect from Green. Looking at Matt Harmon's reception perception for AJ Green last year, he was in the 55th percentile in success versus man coverage, the 30th percentile versus press coverage. Those are things that are alarming, especially when you consider that AJ Green is 30 years old now. It's kind of like Matt Harmon said it, the elephant in the room. You know, no one wants to say it, but the 30, the 30 year old Mark, it's not necessarily the kiss of death from wide receivers, but it is alarming when you start seeing these numbers in terms of game speed, in terms of his target share and the production that came off of that, and in terms of his success versus man coverage in the 30th percentile. That is not good. Those things are totally outside of being team dependent, which are the things I look at when you start uh, breaking down numbers. Um, it doesn't matter how bad the offensive line was or the quarterback, your game speed is completely on you. There's a few other numbers that I was looking at, and, and these are like probably over my head, but when I had Josh ADHD on the channel, if you guys watched a couple weeks ago, he was on the behind the scenes fantasy football industry show. He's the one who makes the tools for Rotoviz, uh, Roto Grinders, and Fantasy Insiders and stuff. He said one of the numbers to look at is the racer. So I'm not even really sure what it stands for. I think it's receiving air yards over, I don't know, something, but he said it's a very predictive 
statistic that not a lot of people are aware of. Uh, when I looked at Racer, right, and uh, among NFL wide receivers right now, Green ranked 53rd among NFL wide receivers that had at least 60 targets. And I know that wasn't really a good breakdown considering I'm just telling you I don't even know what it means, but this guy who makes these tools and is, is a big time coder and looks at numbers all day told me that Racer is one of the stick, sticky predictive numbers in terms of success for wide receivers and AJ Green ranked 53rd in that. So that is not something that I like to hear. So for the most part, um, those really high volume numbers, his target share, his air yards market share kept him alive in fantasy football. But now you have John Ross, who is legitimately their wide receiver too. You have Tyler Eifert, supposedly healthy. And you have, you know, both Joe Mixon and Gio Bernard operating as pass catching back. I'm not sure he sees that type of target share. And if he's not going to see that type of target share and he's kind of falling off in terms of game speed and these things, I just don't like AJ Green setup. And I just don't think this offense is going to be that good overall again. So if he falls to me in the third round, sure, I'll take Green, but he won't be someone I'm reaching for in the second and trying to get hyped on. So that would uh, finish up tier number four. If you are interested in getting all my tiers, I'm talking about all my wide receivers. I think they're ranked like all the way through 80 wide receivers. As long as my top 250 overall rankings, um, positional rankings, all broken down by tiers my top busts, sleepers, must draft players, all that kind of stuff. You can check out my draft guide, people. I already kind of mentioned it, I believe, in the beginning of the video, but it is linked down below. It has all this information. It's a one-stop shop for your fantasy football draft. It's completely uh, interactive. It's completely mobile, so you can get it on your laptop, your phone. It's perfect for your draft. You don't have to go out and buy anything. Um, you just purchase it on the website and then you'll get an automated email within five minutes giving you instructions on how to access it. It's got videos in there. It's got articles that you're not going to get on my YouTube channel or on my blog or anything like that. So if you haven't checked it out yet, highly recommend uh, you do that and check out some of the ratings and reviews that we've gotten from it on the website. It'll be there. People have been pleased with it. It's updated weekly. My rankings are always updated. So if your draft is not for a couple weeks, then you know I stay up to date in the draft guide. So please, please, please check that out out. And then Fitz was number 11. Fitz is, is just Fitz. Until he is dead, until he is not on an NFL team, he, you, you, you can't disrespect the man. And I know it's not good analysis, but that's the only analysis I can give you. Obviously, you're not as bullish on him in the standard leagues because his touchdown upside is probably capped at like six or seven, which we've seen for the last couple of years. But he's going to catch a ton of balls. He's one of the only targets in an offense led by Sam Bradford now, who loves throwing the ball over the middle, short intermediate passes. So Larry Fitz. Let's move on to tier number five. We have wide receiver 12, Mike Evans, uh, 13, Adam Thielen, 14, Doug Baldwin. Evans is not a guy I necessarily want as my wide receiver one, but you know, every man has his price. He's a super volatile guy in terms of touchdowns. He'll be without Jameis Winston for the first three games of the year. Vegas actually put his over under four total touchdowns on the year at five and a half which is surprising because you would assume someone with a touchdown ceiling that we've seen from him, right? Was it a 13 or whatever? Um, that Vegas would have it at like seven and a half, maybe eight and a half, but clearly they are not banking on a big year from Mike Evans. And like I've always said, those are not concrete, but there's a reason Vegas stays in business because they're pretty damn good at projecting things. He will still be the wide receiver one there. He still should command 130, 140 targets, but don't ever draft him again thinking he's going to give you that 2016 season, I think it was, where he went off. Because now they just have, they, they have Deshaun Jackson and an emerging Chris Godwin, OJ Howard, Cameron Brape. You know, they have all of these targets there. So the volume is just not going to be what people want it to be for Evans. Um, not a horrible wide receiver one, but not someone that uh, that you probably can depend on week over week because he's not someone that's always consistent. But he's my number 12 right now. Um, Thielen is my 13. He is a high floor wide receiver. Uh, I'm not really going to scoff at him if I have to draft him in my leagues. He's proven that he's not a one-year wonder, so I don't think he's going to fall off whatsoever. He's gotten an upgrade at quarterback and Kirk Cousins. He's running like 80% of his, his routes from the slot. He only ran 50-ish 50, like 50 percent of his routes from the slot last year, which was kind of surprising. When I looked back at it, looked back at it. Sorry, I got to slow my roll a little bit. I think I might have Tourette's. When people have Tourette's, do they only curse or do they just do like random shit all the time? How does that work? Someone with Tourette's, let me know. And try not to interrupt your sentence mid, mid typing it in the comment section below. What was I even saying about Thielen? He's my wide receiver 13. I think like we pretty much saw his ceiling last year, but luckily for Thielen owners, his floor and his ceiling probably aren't that different. So I'm not going to be mad if I, if I take Thielen with my third or fourth round pick. Baldwin. Now Baldwin would easily be a, Baldwin would probably be ranked above, definitely Fitz, Green. Might even be my wide receiver eight this year had the injury not occurred, of course. He's strictly down here because of this knee injury that happened. Um, anytime there's a multi-week injury without an actual return timetable date in the preseason, uh, that scares the shit out of me. 
So I prefer not to draft guys who are hurt in the preseason. And I say this a lot, but Scott Pianowski of Yahoo said it best the other day. He said, don't chase injuries because injuries will find you throughout the throughout the season for fantasy owners. He's expected to be ready for week one. I still, I don't I don't know if I buy that until we start seeing videos of him running if, until he's back at practice or something. So I'm not just gonna take their word for it and start drafting him as wide receiver eight. There is something else that, that Coach Pete Carroll said, kind of went under the radar that kind of makes me a little bit nervous about Baldwin. He said that Baldwin came into camp kind of off. Something wasn't right. Um, and then he continued to practice through it. And now he's out, which means that like, if he came into camp off, right? That was weeks ago, months ago, if not. That means something was hurt when he came into camp. We don't know how long he was hurt for. Maybe this was something that was bothering him for months. So this could be bigger than we actually know, right? This could be something that lingers on. This could be something that if it wasn't healed over the off season, right? If he came into camp something off and then practice on it, and then it got worse and they finally were like, you have to sit out. This could be something that got worse as he practiced on it, so maybe um, he will need some kind of cleanup. We, I don't know. I'm not a doctor, obviously, and I'm not going to give you give medical advice here. But it scares me that we don't know how long it's been hurting Baldwin for, and we really don't have sufficient ev uh, information on how healthy he is or how healthy he's going to be at the start of the season. And for that reason, I am out. Tier number six, uh, I have four guys. Mark Cooper, wide receiver 15. Juju Smith, wide receiver 16. Tyree Kill, wide receiver 17, and Chris Hogan, wide receiver 18. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to move Amari Cooper down, possibly even all the way down. It's still in this tier, but the last wide receiver in this tier. I'll be honest, man, I'm terrified about drafting Amari Cooper in redraft leagues. Um, and it's possible, I think it's very likely that Cooper is just never going to pan out to be the guy that a lot of people expected to be when he came into the NFL. Like a top five, you know, he was a top five pick, so a top five prospect. Um, and people think he's going to be Odell Beckham. I think it's clear that he does not gain separation like Beckham. He is not good at catching the ball in the end zone and the red zone. Um, so his contested catches are not good or not great either. Um, I just don't think Cooper's going to kind of pan out to be what we think he's going to be. And last year was awful, man. It's not promising drafting a player coming off. You know, it's not promising banking on a player to just start being good again after a horrible year. Uh, but there are a lot of changes there. Obviously, Michael, Tra uh, Michael Crabtree is gone. John Gruden is in as the head coach. And for as much as you want to shit on Gruden and what his play style might be, he has been incredible at getting his wide receiver ones in his offense to produce as wide receiver ones in fantasy. Um, he has been the head coach of NFL teams nine different seasons. Uh, and the average wide receiver one finish there is wide receiver 13.9. So while it's not exactly in the wide receiver one range, this is about where you're drafting him. And his average finish for wide receivers is around wide receiver 14. They've never finished outside of wide receiver 25. And he's been loud and clear about making Cooper the focal point of this passing offense. They bring in Jordy Nelson, but, you know, he's old as shit. So who knows what he really has left in the tank. He could end up being a guy who catches 40, 45 passes, 500 yards, four touchdowns or something like that, which obviously won't take away from Cooper. Martavis Bryant is there, but he's literally been running with the twos in practice. Reports have not been good about Bryant. Um, so as much as you like him as a talent, things are not lining up well for Martavis Bryant. He's not even really a guy I want to take a late round flyer on at this point. So uh, while it's like there seems to be a lot of mouths to feed there in Oakland, I, I really don't see that being the case. So Cooper might be a guy who's just force fed 130, 140 targets this year. So by default, you kind of have to like Cooper just, just based on volume. Like I always say, you chase volume and redraft. Juju is my wide receiver 16. Um, Juju's my boy, man. I, I've been, I, I've loved him since I started doing my fantasy analysis, like back in March or it's, dude, it's been like fucking five months I've been doing this shit now, I feel like. So if again, <clears throat> if you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button because I've been doing this. I've been, I, I'm old enough to, I'm old enough to remember when I started analysis for 2018. We'll put it that way. Uh, Juju's been balling this preseason. He's got two touchdowns in two games. He's clearly a huge focal point of this um, offense with Brown or without Brown. I still think he's one of the safest early to mid round wide receiver picks for you. That gives you a really high floor. And I think he's got ceiling that most people are just ignoring because he was so good down the stretch last year. And some of that was without Antonio Brown, but the majority of it, of it was with Antonio Brown in the lineup too. So people like to ride that off. Um, Big Ben is coming off a year where over the second half of the year, he paced out for 5,000 passing yards and almost 40 touchdowns. Oh, sorry, my camera died. And those numbers from Big Ben over the second half do not include the Jags playoff game where he threw for like 470 yards, five touchdowns. Um, so looks like Ben's going to throw some silly numbers this year. 
They are without Ryan Shazier, who is like the heart of that defense, and their defense has not looked good this preseason. So that I think both of those things benefit Juju, of course. The next wide receiver we have is Reek, Tyreek Hill. Um, so he's my wide receiver 17 right now, and I know people are going to be irrationally high on him after last week's preseason game, guys. He was someone I loved last year. I was telling you not to fade him going into last year, but he is too boomer bust for me to rely on him with my top 30 or 35 picks where is where he's going his ADP I think his ADP is like 28 or 32 it probably shot up after this weekend um guys like you you have to understand that we knew him and Mahomes are going to connect on deep balls this year obviously and one of them just happened to come in this preseason game like you shouldn't be surprised when you see that happen that you know those are going to occur in 2018 and just because it happened in a preseason game doesn't mean it's going to happen every week um, and there will still be games where Tyreek Hill probably goes like four for 50 and Sammy Watkins goes six for 78 or something like that. Watkins is being lined up all over the field, which is good. He's been in the X, he's been in the slot, he's been the flanker, um, which is good. I know the production hasn't been there, but the usage is what I look for in preseason. Um, so what I'm saying is don't get irrationally high on Tyreek Hill because he's going to be boomer bust. He will make those plays. That should not surprise anybody. Um, that should already have been a piece of your analysis, knowing those plays are going to come. But he's too bu boomer bust for me to be picked as a, a second round or third round pick. But wide receiver 17, if he falls to me in the fourth round, like, okay, I'm not going to hate that. But Chris Hogan is a guy that I have been owning in almost all my redraft leagues as well. And I know a lot of, a lot of people are like, oh, are you that high in him? I think he is my 40th ranked player overall. And I actually saw my, he's been there for like weeks for me. Chris Hogan's been that high. And I saw the team at Roto World did a live draft on YouTube yesterday. And I didn't watch all of it, but I looked at some of the results. And Evan Silva, if you don't know who Evan Silva is, I don't know. Again, baby, what is you doing? Evan Silva, pretty much the fantasy GOAT, actually took Chris Hogan at number 40. So that made me feel pretty good. Um, and he had a great point. It was just literally like sometimes fantasy football is not hard, guys. You don't have to look that hard into it. Chris Hogan is the premier, the number one wide receiver in this last preseason game. Julian Edelman was in there. Julian Edelman played in 27 of Brady's 35 snaps. Chris Hogan played in 31 of 35. So you're seeing Hogan's going to be a full-time player, obviously, even when Julian Edelman is there. He had seven targets with Brady in the first half while Julian Edelman was on the field. Brandon Cooks is gone, which means they don't have another deep threat on the outside, right? Gronk is running up the seam. Hogan is the only one on the outside, and Brady is a guy who throws the ball deep a lot. He's always one of the top NFL passers in terms of deep ball attempts and deep ball accuracy. Chris Hogan is going to be not only an end zone monster, but a deep threat. He balled out in the uh, in the Super Bowl. I think he caught six passes for like 120 yards and a touchdown, guys. Listen, uh, if you're fading Chris Hogan this year, you are going to be disappointed at the end of the year. That is like that is one thing I am super sure about. And then we move on to tier number seven. Tier number seven, and this actually, before we move on to tier number seven though, I would like to thank today's sponsors for the video. This is not the skull. This is a pretty dope Falcon skull though, huh? I bought this in Mexico when I was in Cancun like two weeks ago. Probably a horrible purchase, but I thought it was gonna be like, you know, I was like, when I start making like a little studio for Big Dogs Gotta Eat, when I make the videos, this will be a nice little piece of decoration. But for now, it's just like sitting on my living room table. But if you like the skull, if you appreciate the skull, I'm gonna call him, I'm gonna call him Hector from now on. Hector, if you like Hector, go give my mans a thumbs up. I would very much appreciate that. Um, sponsor of the video, fantasyjocks.com, guys. Championship belts, championship rings. They have awesome Lombardi trophies. You can get your team's name inscribed on the side of them. So your past year's champions dating back to, you can fit, I think like 10 or 12 team names on them. So um, everyone could be represented. If you bring home a chip, you should be properly anointed a past champ. And that's what Fantasy Jocks does for you guys. They are the industry leader. They've won the FSTA award for the best championship belt and, and the best championship products. Now they also have draft boards. If you are drafting within the next week or two weeks, you can get expedited shipping and have the draft board sent to you quickly. It's like uh, you can fit, I think up to 18 teams and 24 or 26 rounds. So it fits any draft size that you need. It's got all the player stickers involved. It's got these little, uh, let see what else we got. Oh, I got some of the packages here. They always send me over stuff for my redraft leagues. They have koozies for all your league mates where you can put your team's name on them, send you over. They even got a yellow flag so when your boys are taking too goddamn long to pick, you could just kind of chuck it at their head. I will be putting this to good use this offseason. They have all different types of draft board kits depending on how much you want to spend. They have a, a, a belt involved in one of the draft kits. So get everyone to chip in five, eight, ten bucks and grab yourself uh, some gear for your league, a little bit of swag this year. 
And that's really all you got to do, fellers. And use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, for 10% off your entire purchase. It's really not that difficult. Have everyone chip in a little bit on top of their buy-in, and you'll be set to go. Fantasy Jocks, thank you for sponsoring today's video. Let's move on to tier numero siete. Thank you, Hector, for that one. He whispered what, what seven was in Spanish. I wasn't quite sure. And it is Josh Gordon as wide receiver 19, Marvin Jones, Sammy Watkins, Jarvis Landry, Allen Robinson. This is a tier littered with question marks, starting with Josh Gordon, who has been creeping back in my rankings. I took him out when the news of him missing the offseason or the training camp was kind of, those reports were coming out. I'm pretty sure he was just kind of trying to avoid the Hard Knocks cameras. I didn't watch last night's episode of Hard Knocks yet, but I'm not sure if he was on it. I'm not sure what's going on with Des Bryant. I don't think he's going to sign with the Browns, but if he does, that obviously puts a little bit of a hamper on Josh Gordon. Now, he's not the in between the 20 guys that, that Des has been throughout his career. He's not going to be that guy. That's Josh Gordon. Uh, what it does is it puts another red zone target into the mix where I think that brings down the ceiling of both Gordon and Landry, uh, but we'll have to see if Dez signs or not. If he doesn't, I could probably move Josh Gordon up a little bit into that next tier. Not much to really argue here. <coughs> argue here. We know how much of a talent he is, but the question marks are, of course, that he's missed all of training camp. Um, we haven't seen a large sample size from Josh Gordon, and we don't know how pass heavy this offense is going to be. They have Njoku, they have Jarvis Landry, they have Duke Johnson. When Josh Gordon has been balling out in his previous years, it's always been with no other weapons really around him. Um, so it's a little bit more crowded than usual. I'm not sure he's going to see like a huge number of, of targets, but of course the volume is there. The game speed has been the same since he's played in like 2013. So talent will always be there. He's just a little risky uh, for me. I think if he drops into like the late fourth, fifth round, I'd be okay pulling the trigger on Gordon, but that's kind of my, my quick elevator pitch on Gordon. Move over to Marvin Jones, number 20. I broke it down between Marvin Jones and Golden Tate. I would much rather have Marvin Jones. I just think, uh, even in this preseason, Jones has looked really good. Stafford's targeting him on a ton of deep throws, and that's kind of where he really thrived. Last year, he was averaging 18 yards per reception. I think that was number one in the NFL, possibly number two behind maybe Terry Kill, but I'm not exactly sure. But Marvin Jones is up there in terms of yards per reception, air yards, air yards per target, like all those things. One of the premier deep threats, and we're seeing that already this preseason, which makes me very, very happy about that. Um, the thing that kind of scares me, though, is, well, one, we're seeing Kenny Galladay starting on in two wide receiver sets. So if you guys are not um, really reading into that, here's what you need to know. The Lions run three wide receiver sets more than any team in the NFL. Over the past two years, that's been 85% of their plays out of three wide receiver sets. So... The other like 14% where Kenny Galladay's on the field over Golden Tate is not really a big deal. Um, so don't look, don't read too much into that. Golden Tate is still very much playing on a huge majority of plays. But uh, what it does mean is Marvin Jones' splits with Kenny Galladay. When you look at them last year, they were it's kind of dramatic. You see that he averaged almost four full fantasy points more per game half PPR, five in full PPR, when Galladay did not play. So that's a little bit scary. But at the same time, don't get me wrong, because you look at the splits. When Galladay played, it's not like they were that bad. He's giving you 11 half PPR fantasy points per game. So it's, he's, it's not like he was a dud. He's still completely usable, and 11 half point fantasy points per game is, um, is fine. Plus, he gives you that ceiling of hitting on a touchdown or a deep ball at any given any given week. So I still like Marvin Jones very much if you wait on wide receivers. If you end up going like running back, running back, tight end, get your wide receiver one in round four, and then Marvin Jones is your wide receiver two. Then we move on to Sammy Watkins. And if you watch my bold prediction video, obviously you know how high I am on Sammy Watkins. Um, everything out of camp said that him and Mahomes have had a great connection. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that come to fruition in any of the preseason games. But um, as I've mentioned before with uh, Graham Barfield tracked where Watkins has been running his routes in these preseason games and he has been running a lot of them from the slot. I think it was like 11 of 23 from the slot and 12 of 23 from the X position. And last year, you know, he was just used as like an X, uh, kind of like a decoy in, in Sean McVay's system. And uh, I, I think the usage of him all over the field is going to mean a higher target volume that people than people are originally assuming. So. Uh, we'll have to see what happens in week three. It's possible that I have to move Sammy Watkins down my rankings a little bit if we don't see production out of him. But I still like Sammy Watkins. I do. Uh, I'm very interested to see what happens in the week three preseason game. Next on my list, wide receiver 22, is Jarvis Landry. And I really think people are sleeping on Jarvis, man. I think he's a very good player, and I still think he projects out to see about 125 <clears throat> targets or so. I think the connection between him and Tyrod is very real. 
Um, I'm not just saying that from like watching Hard Knocks, but you can even see it in Hard Knocks. I'm, I think he's super talented, man. He is a very, he's one of the best slot receivers in the NFL and he's going to see volume again and he's dropping to like pick 55 or 60, which I think is, um, you know, you're getting him like two rounds later than, than you've been able to get him in the previous years. And I don't think his production is going to be that much different than we've seen him, than we've seen him have. And his target drop off is going to be a little bit of a thing coming over from Miami, but I don't think it's gonna be as big as most people. Obviously you're not gonna project him for 170 targets, but last year, how many targets did Jarvis Landry have last year? Me uno momento while I look at pro football focus. If any of you guys are looking to grab the pro football focus edge package, which is $30 for the year, um, there's promo in my in my description down below. There's a promo code for either five or ten dollars off if you go through that link down there and use the promo code. It's a really good package. It has like all the player grades, wide receiver, cornerback matchups, a bunch of different cool, useful tools. 156 targets. So I don't expect him to see that many um, in 2018. But if you look back at 2016, he had he had 122 targets per Pro Football Focus. He still went off for about 1,150 yards and five touchdowns. So 122 targets is absolutely in the realm of possibilities for Jarvis Landry in Cleveland. I, don't, I think it might even be higher than that, to be honest with you. If he can do 1,150 yards uh, on that, I think that's completely possible this year. And someone you're getting in the fifth or sixth round, I'm good on Jarvis Landry there for sure. And last on this list is Allen Robinson, wide receiver 23. Some people are going to be a lot higher on him than me. Um, I don't know. There's a very good chance I won't end up with him on my team. I think someone else in my draft will probably take him just because they see the name Allen Robinson and they see him going to Chicago Bears and there's a lot of hype this offseason, of course. I'll have to see what he does in preseason week three. Um, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves on the Bears a little bit. I mean, I love what they did in the offseason and all the changes, uh, but everything is riding on Mitch Trubisky. If Mitch Trubisky doesn't play up to everyone's expectations, then it's going to be a huge hit to everyone else on the team, of course, and this offense will kind of fall on its face. Now, Allen Robinson actually, you know, he hasn't been good on a uh, on a football, I was going to say on a fantasy football field, but on a, in a fantasy football roster on a, in a lineup. Hasn't been good uh, in almost two years, I think two and a half years maybe at this point. Coming off the major injury, Trubisky, if you look at him as a passer, he's much, much, much more accurate over the middle of the field than on the outside where Allen Robinson's obviously going to be running his routes. Um, that's per like Warren Sharp, who is one of the best minds in football right now. His football preview, he talks about how Trubisky is so much better over the middle of the field and he's a pretty poor passer when it comes to outside the numbers. Even going back to his days at UNC, he loves slot receivers like Ryan Switzer had 95 catches and like 1,100 yards in Trubisky's one season as the UNC starter. Um, so that's why, I, that's why I'm super high on Miller. Not only do I love Anthony Miller as a talent, but I think he is a perfect match for what Trubisky brings to this offense. So Allen Robinson is just a guy that I need to see. Like, you know, I could be wrong and, and I could miss this train, but I would be perfectly happy not getting on board with it. But Allen Robinson obviously offers the upside. I definitely wouldn't take him with expectations of him finishing as a wide receiver one. He's more of like a low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three in my books. Um, and he is my wide receiver 23. So that wraps up tier number seven, and that's actually going to be all the players that I cover in this video. I hope y'all enjoyed. Again, if you want to see the rest of my tiers, the rest of my rankings, you can do so via my draft guide, which is available on bigdogsfantasy.com. If you are listening via podcast, I would very, very much appreciate a, uh, a rating and a review if you would be so kind to take the time. You know, I put a lot of work into these videos and I appreciate when you guys leave a thumbs up down below. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're new and we'll be doing the same thing for running backs probably next week or so. So I will see y'all then. Um, good luck in your drafts if you're drafting this weekend and uh, enjoy your weekend. So peace.